Back at the first of this year, we put out a fun little episode all about the various weird special days and holidays that are scheduled to occur each year. In that episode, National Days, among all the guff about Pi Day, the illumination of the history of Talk Like a Pirate Day, and a frank discussion about how certain federal holidays in the United States came to be, we totally failed to mention the one holiday that bears most of the responsibility for the messed up system of accounting for days and months that we currently suffer under. See, the main problem an accurate day, week, and month measuring system faces is that we count a day as an even 24 hours. When, as we are sure you well know, it's actually more like 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59.9985376 seconds on the day of this writing. And even that would be something we could work with if it weren't for the fact that tomorrow is going to be 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59.9987793 seconds. A loss of 1.2207 milliseconds. Which would be still sort of fine if we hadn't lost 1.4624 milliseconds over yesterday. To really drive the point home, on this date in 1973, the day was 24 hours, 0 minutes, and 0.002490 seconds long. Roughly 2.5 milliseconds longer than it should have been. Point being, of course... None of the calculations we use on a daily basis to determine when one day stops and the next day begins, our supposed 24-hour day, is correct, and it isn't even the same amount of incorrect on a day-to-day -day basis, which means we constantly have to adjust our counting devices to take account of these changes. Because what happens if you don't is that the days and months and even the seasons begin to shift around in uncomfortable ways. It takes not very long at all for Fridays to start happening earlier and earlier and cutting into your Thursdays, which, while it might sound like a really good idea at first, also means your Mondays are cutting into your Sundays. And once the days start shifting around, so do the weeks and months, and then the seasons get all out of whack as they shift too. We'll explain better in a bit, but for now, just know that it all becomes a real problem if you're the sort of person looking to celebrate a very specific occasion on its proper and correct day. See, if you're a Christian, it's vitally important that certain special days occur at the same time every year, much the same as it is for other religions. It's fine to float Christmas around a little bit, for instance, because it was more important to acknowledge the purpose of Jesus' birth and celebrate that than it was to know exactly what day it happened on, which no one does. Although there is some disagreement on when the actual date of celebration should be, December 25th is generally accepted in most of the places where it is observed thanks to the 4th century directive from the church, so it's fine. Other important Christian religious observances also occur on fixed dates, so they aren't really a problem when it comes to figuring out when to celebrate them. Every November 1st, we do All Saints Day. It doesn't matter what day of the week it is, just do it whenever it comes around. However, there is one holy day that absolutely, positively must occur on its proper date without exception. And after a couple of thousand years, it's going to keep being celebrated on the proper day, no matter who says what about it. It is, of course, Easter. Easter is what is called a movable day. That is, it occurs on a different date in different years. In fact, Easter's date of observance has to be calculated anew each year based on a number of factors, including the phases of the moon and the date of the spring equinox, and can vary by as much as 35 days. The calculations for fixing the date of Easter are so complicated that they have their own name, computus, which is Latin for calculation. And since days aren't all the same length, and months are based on the phases of the moon, and seasons are based on the movement of the earth around the sun, and none of these periods produce perfectly round numbers that are easy to work with, we have to constantly jiggle things around to readjust for all the variants, so we aren't having winter in July in the northern hemisphere, waking up at 10 a.m. in the middle of the night, and having Easter right on top of Christmas. In fact, if it weren't for Easter, and all the holy days and observances whose dates are connected to it, and the need to recalculate everything all the time to make sure they all keep happening when they're supposed to, we'd be very confused about what was happening when, because we'd have a really terrible calendar.
This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. In order to really understand the calendar and its various forms, functions, and problems, you have to start by understanding three basic concepts. The day, the solar year, and something called lunation. To begin with, the concept of a day is really the most essential bit. Sure, there are hours, minutes, and seconds, but those are all derived from the length of a day. It's one of only two naturally occurring units of time, the other being the year. And, as we pointed out before, we're already in trouble because there's some discrepancy between what we think of as a day and what a day actually is. Meaning that units derived from the day are also always slightly wrong. Most of us are perfectly happy to accept that a day is 24 hours long, but it clearly isn't. A day is defined as the amount of time it takes for the Earth to complete one rotation on its axis, marked by the Sun returning to the same position in the sky two consecutive times, say from noon to noon. This is called the solar day. From this, you can calculate the duration of a second as 1 86,400th of a day, and from that, minutes and hours. Although when Ptolemy in 140 CE did it, he came up with two distinct versions of the hour, and therefore the day, neither of which match with what we use today, or, in fact, with what was anything like accurate. It wasn't until 1000 CE that al-Biruni and other Muslim scholars worked out a system that corrected Ptolemy's measurements and better fit with what is in use today. These days, we use an atomic clock to precisely count exact seconds, from which we then calculate the passage of a day. Currently, the definition of a second is precisely the duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom, making a day last exactly 794,243,384,928,000 of those periods which is nice and useful and easy to work with. Still 86,400 seconds in one day, but they are now so exact that we can be assured our current days are as exactly 24 hours as they can be. However, as mentioned, this doesn't precisely match up with the real world, and you don't even have to peer down to milliseconds to see evidence of the problem with the definition of a day. Because of the variance in the real-world passage of a day, the solar day, when the sun returns to the same position in the sky as the previous day, versus the precise atomic clock calculated amount of time that passes in a day, we have to keep making adjustments. Otherwise, the atomic time would run ahead of solar time. Some adjustments are relatively minor, like the leap second, which is added or subtracted as needed by the people in charge of tracking the actual time at the International Earth Rotation and Reference Systems Service. When a leap second is scheduled to occur, whatever day it occurs on is suddenly redefined as either 24 hours and 1 second, or 23 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds in length. Not 24 hours exactly. And these adjustments can be brought about by any number of things that might affect the rotation of the Earth, like significant changes in the distribution of the Earth's mass, tidal friction, and even significant earthquakes. The worst part is, there are at least two other ways of calculating how long a day is, including stellar days, which rely on the position of the stars in the sky. Basically, whatever time you think it is, is always wrong. So you might as well give up on ever being on time for anything ever again. It can't be done. Not that you were going to be on time in the first place. Now that the extremely simple concept of a day is out of the way, we can move on to the second of our three basic concepts, the solar year, also known as a tropical year. At its simplest, the solar year is the time it takes the sun to return to the same position in the cycle of seasons as observed from Earth, say from vernal equinox to vernal equinox. And as we all know, that period is 365 days, at least according to your calendar. Except we all know it isn't. The solar year is actually approximately 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45 seconds. And that's approximate because the Earth's orbit around the Sun isn't perfectly circular, and various forces act upon the Earth in its orbit in a variety of ways, and really, it's at least as complicated as figuring out how long a day is. 
It isn't even how long it takes the Earth to go around the Sun. That actually takes about 20 minutes longer when measured as a sidereal year. Sidereal years are measured by how long it takes for the background of stars to return to their same position on whatever date you started measuring from, probably another equinox. And the difference is because of something called the precession of the equinoxes, which happens mostly because the Earth wobbles on its axis. Honestly, the further down we dig, the less accurate and true any given measure of time is. The extra 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45 seconds of the solar year is why we have to do leap years and add days to the calendar every so often. But we'll come to that in a few more minutes, I expect. For now, just keep it in mind with respect to Easter. The third and final bit of knowledge needed before we really begin talking about calendars is lunation, also called a synodic month. It marks the average period between one new moon and the next. And if you really want to have your calendars messed up, make it a calendar based on lunar cycles. The whole point of the time period we call a month is that it is supposed to represent one complete cycle of the phases of the moon. But of course, this never has been and never will be a nice, easy to work with number. No, the average lunation or synodic month is about 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes, and 2.8 seconds. Average. What really happens is that the lunation can vary anywhere from 29 and a quarter to very nearly but not quite 30 days because of gravity. Its own, the Earth's, and the Sun's. Plus the fact that the Moon is in a slightly eccentric orbit, plus the fact it sort of has to keep up with us as we go around the Sun, plus, well, a whole bunch of other factors. In short, it's a mess. In fact, everything is a mess. Lunation, solar years, days, all of it. And this uncertainty and imperfection and constantly changing numbers means it is really quite difficult to come up with a calendar that even comes close to keeping things in line and happening at the right time. At least, our definition of the right time. Without the various adjustments to the calendar, it would be merely four years before New Year began on the wrong day. In 28 years, you'd be in the wrong week, and by the time you became a grandparent, you'd be about a month out, seasonally speaking. Making accurate and true calendars is very important, but also extremely complicated and very difficult. But the Sumerians certainly gave it a shot. They developed the first confirmed known calendar sometime around the 22nd to 21st century BCE, which was later picked up and refined by the Babylonians. They developed what is known as a lunar solar calendar. The lunar solar calendar uses both the phases of the moon and the solar year to determine the length of months and years. In their version, each new month began with a new moon, and lasted however many days it was until the next new moon occurred, meaning their months had no fixed number of days. After 12 such months, the calendar started over again each spring. The Babylonians weren't fools, though, and soon noticed that seasons were getting out of whack and not showing up when they should, according to the calendar, so they soon developed something called an intercalary month. The intercalary month is an additional month inserted into a calendar at a predetermined interval and is intended to bring a calendar back in line with a solar or sidereal year, depending on a given culture's preference. The Babylonians inserted a special month at the end of every 17th and 19th year to keep the seasons happening when they should. Sticking to the cycles of the moon, each month consisted of three weeks of seven days, each with a fourth week that could be eight or nine days long, depending on when the next new moon occurred. This Sumerian calendar by way of the Babylonians was successful enough that it was picked up and used as the basis of the Persian, Zoroastrian, and Hebrew calendars. Now, some of you may be jumping up and down in your seats and wondering about things like Stonehenge and other stone structures located around the world, which certainly must have been some sort of early calendar, obviously. While it is true that this may have been the case for some of them, based on various cycles of the sun or moon, they didn't receive the sort of widespread adoption that other more definitely calendars did. Many of them have a doubtful and speculative history as an actual useful what-day-is-it sort of calendar, rather than a device constructed to indicate one very particular celestial event or a simple accidental coincidental such alignment. For now, we're going to pass by them in favor of those with a more widespread adoption and a more clearly defined and well-understood usage. 
As for the Mayan calendar system, it's just that, a system of closely related and complex calendars that, while interesting in their own right, didn't really help shape the modern calendar or have a large impact on the world until people started making movies about them and going into a panic. We could do an episode all about them at some future date, if only their calendars hadn't stopped working several years ago now. The Zoroastrians and Persians would go on to further refine the calendars they used to suit their individual needs. The Persians in particular switched to a solar calendar because the main deity in Persia was closely related to the sun. By adding an intercalary month every six years, they could more closely align the Persian calendar with the observable seasons and, by naming that extra month after the deity, celebrate the deity more regularly. Eventually, though, the entire calendar system was reformed by Persian mathematician, astronomer, poet, and all-around romantic guy Omar Khayyam in 1079 CE. As part of creating a better Persian calendar, Khayyam took it upon himself to rework most of the calculations needed to properly set a calendar, and came up with a length for a full year of 365.24219858156 days a figure accurate to five significant digits, only off by roughly three-fourths of a second. Meanwhile, in China, they too developed the lunar solar calendar, which we discussed in our episode on the zodiac, so check there for details. While the Hindu lunar solar calendar was developed in ancient India and parts of Southeast Asia. To be fair though, the Hindu calendar isn't just one calendar, it's a set of several different calendars developed and specialized for the various regions of India to mark local important holy and festival days. Each one is more or less uniquely calculated, but uses the same basic principles with intercalary adjustments every three years. Although chiefly used for astrological purposes these days, derivatives of the Hindu calendars are still used today in the Buddhist religion. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in classical Greece, the different Greek states all had pretty much their own calendars as well, based in part on the earlier Persian calendars. Some of them didn't even have names for all 12 of the months, and most of them missed the note about using intercalary dates to keep things in line. The Athenians knew about intercalary months, though, but they weren't much help as they tended to use three separate calendars, one moon-cycle-based 12-month calendar for festivals, one 10-month democratic state calendar used to mark the dates of civic duties and based on the sun, and an agricultural calendar which marked out the position of the stars at certain times of year to keep track of the seasons. The Romans started out even less well. Their initial calendars were based on 10 months and started with spring and March. The problem was winter was initially treated as one exceedingly long month rather than being subdivided. Weeks were composed of eight days with a market day at the end, and the whole thing was such a weird jumble that it didn't come anywhere as close to matching up with the solar year, running about 10 days short. So the Romans were constantly adding intercalary months, weeks, and days to get things to match up again. Eventually, winter was divided up into January and February, and because the Romans had certain superstitions about their months, February bore the brunt of most of the intercalation. At least, sometimes it did, depending on the politicians in charge, as an extra month, depending on where it was placed, might mean that some rulers would have an extra month of their reign, while others might see their reign shortened by leaving the extra time out. The years leading up to 46 BCE were particularly troublesome because numerous extra months were constantly added and removed. Those years came to be known as the years of confusion and were the last straw for Julius Caesar. He decided he'd finally had enough of all the fiddling around and ordered that a new, predictable calendar be created. He demanded it have 365 days so that it matched with the year as closely as possible, and that every fourth year be a leap year with a single day inserted to correct for the deviation. Unfortunately, in order to get everything back in order, the longest year ever had to happen. At 445 days, with two additional months, 46 BCE takes the prize. But once they stopped double counting the leap year every three years, things went pretty smoothly for a little over a thousand years. By 1500 CE, most of the people in much of the world were using the new Julian calendar. Which is about when people started noticing how far the Julian calendar had drifted. See, Julius's calculations were pretty solid. 
but they were off by the technically trivial amount of 11 minutes and 15 seconds. It would take 128 years for the seasons to drift off by one day, but if you do the math, you'll note a whole lot more than 128 years had passed. By 1500 CE, about 10 times as much. Meaning that important dates like the spring equinox were off by at least 10 days. Which was absolutely terrible to the Catholic Church. Because as you'll recall, the date of Easter is fixed not based on a specific date, but on several specific events. One of which is the vernal equinox which, according to the Julian calendar, was now 10 days wrong and getting wronger. Pope Gregory XIII decided something had to be done to keep Easter in its proper place. So, Pope Gregory brought in Italian doctor and astronomer Aloysius Luigi Lilius to fix things, which he did. And his big fix was to correct the way leap years were decided. See, once every four years turned out to be the wrong formula. You ended up with too many leap years that way, which was what was really causing the problem. The fractional leftovers in the length of the year were still messing things up ever so slightly. It took a long time to notice, 1500 years as you'll recall, but it was still happening. So Luigi's fix was to do better math. You could still do leap years just about every four years, that was fine. So any year that divided by four evenly should be a leap year. Except, you needed to leave out three in every 400 years. So any year that was a leap year, but that was also a multiple of 100, should be skipped. Unless it was also divisible by 400, in which case, leave it in. A brilliant solution that meant the years averaged out to as close to the length of the solar year as you could get, only three ten thousandths off. Good enough. The Gregorian calendar was introduced with absolutely no further problems whatsoever. Except. Well, except the Pope was Catholic, and it may surprise you to learn many other people aren't. The British weren't, by and large, at the time, and neither was the majority of North America. Eventually they would change after over another 150 years, but many other places wouldn't, and some still don't. Also except, the new Gregorian calendar had been backdated to refigure the proper dates that should be in effect since the adoption of the Julian calendar, which meant that Pope Gregory had to issue a decree removing 10 days from the year to bring things back into line. So if you were on the Gregorian calendar, you had to get by without the days between October 4th and October 15th, 1582. And if you didn't switch over at the same time as everyone else, maybe because you weren't using the Gregorian calendar yet, you had to find 10 days of your own to leave out. Or more, if you were particularly late in switching over. Which is why, in 1908, when the Russian shooting team arrived in London for the Olympics on July 10th for their scheduled matches, they failed to compete. For everyone else, it was July 23rd, and the Russians were late. Thank you for listening to another episode of GM Word of the Week. We hope you enjoyed it. Honestly, this episode was going to be about something else entirely. But when we read Humble Pie, When Math Goes Wrong in the Real World by Matt Parker of Stand Up Math fame last week, we had to recalculate and go with this instead. We'll link to it on Amazon in the show notes for this episode. A big thank you to our patrons on Patreon. We started out this year with a support goal, and we're happy to announce that thanks to the contributions of our very fine patrons, we're just over halfway there. With them supporting us, the episodes just keep getting better and better, as we can afford to access more research and reading materials with which to inform our episodes while keeping the episodes ad-free. If you'd like to join them and help out, head over to gmwordoftheweek.com, find the yellow banner at the top, and give it a click. From there, it should be as easy as pie. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who is ever so glad his birthday didn't fall on one of those 19th year Babylonian calendar months. It'd only be two and a half. Music for this episode was provided by Blue Dot Sessions.
Don't be fooled by the calendar. There are only as many days in the year as you make use of.